just do the office. Because thing. between like I'm 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. for the last five days, I've decided to like do physics <laughs> stuff and grade and watch The <laughs> Office from the very beginning. <laughs> so I've been watching it. I've probably watched like 80 episodes in the last Dang. four days. That's impressive. That's, really that's, that's, like, that's like me with the anime. One of the episodes is broken on Netflix. Really? It like no. keeps repeating. It keeps stopping and reloading, oh. and then going back. And I tried to fast forward past it, but then it like would restart at the same place. Huh? So I know. I, now I don't know what happened. Wait, have you never? Oh, okay. You've never watched the entire the entirety of the Office before this? Season? I wasn't sure that I'd watched every episode. All right. And in my kind of system, if you have holes, then, just start over. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, that's, like, that's my system. It's too. like the time that I failed third quarter of organic chemistry. <laughs> Just so retake all of chemistry. Because I missed, I was like playing tennis and I missed so many lectures, I was like, I'm completely lost. So, <laughs> so you just retake the entire I started, I was like, I'm just going to start first quarter all over again. Because organic chemistry, it's like, builds, you know? Yeah, and like, it's not like taking, retaking it, you're not going to learn. There's no stuff. way you can do third quarter by yeah. itself, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fail, actually, I withdrew. Okay. Is there is there a difference there in is. your transcripts and stuff? One says W, <laughs> and one would give you a zero point zero. Oh, Costa. Um. Yeah, ready? Okay. So, could you please state your name, title, and what you do here? <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> what kind of what? It's like an introductory question. What? It sounds more like a deposition. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't there be like music, ding, 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 and then like, oh, here we are with, right? Shouldn't there be that? Okay. Uh, people add in posts. This is going to be tough. Add in posts. This is going to be tough. Add in posts. Sound effects at the end. I also have to, did you have to make Chunny the interviewer? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yep. doubt, I doubt if it was me uh, and go anywhere. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, my name is Michael Patrick O'Byrne. Uh, I am the Gifted High School Program Coordinator, self-made title, and physics teacher here at Interlake High School. Hmm. So, starting off, do you know how did the Interlake's Gifted Program begin? Yes, I do. Could you care <laughs> to share with us that story? Editing! <laughs> yeah, I saw you. Okay, yeah. so back a long time ago, probably about ten years ago, um, there are lots of students in the uh, gifted programs at in the Bellevue School District who would go through uh, ODAL and what they call PRISM at ODAL. And uh, the problem was that after they graduated from the eighth grade from ODAL Middle School, they were kind of just dispersed um, to whatever high school they naturally would go to based on their attendance area, basically. And some would select to go to certain high schools and transfer to those schools. Um, and those students would just be lost in the system. So um, they would be ahead in history and ahead in English and usually way ahead in math and in, different in science. And so sometimes it would be placed higher, but then they would actually run out of classes to take. Like you have to take four years of English, but if you put me in sophomore English, now I only have three years of high school English, and then I've got to do something else my senior year for English and history and all the um, math was a big one because students would be in calculus as a ninth grader and then you know they would be in class with 12th graders and obviously the dynamics of ninth graders and 12th graders doesn't really work. Um, so at the time, the superintendent, one of the best superintendents that I know of in Bellevue, Dr. Mike Riley, who has now passed away, um, he was a pretty good guy on just like, we're going to act. And sometimes, you know, things wouldn't be thoroughly thought through and he was going to act, but at least things were being tried out. Like as a scientist, you appreciate like, well, we're going to give it a shot. We're going to evaluate it. Um, and so there was kind of a big committee thing. Um, and I wasn't really part of that because the first step of that committee was to choose a school. So I would be, you know, obviously biased towards having you guys go to Sammamish. No, I'm just <laughs> um, But Newport and Bellevue were automatically relaxed. Like, they're full. And so um, it really was Sammamish or Interlake was, were the two logical choices to have a new program start at. And so, you know, there were district people, there were parents and kind of community members and some teachers who were kind of involved in that choice. So my end of that was kind of like when they would visit, you know, they came to my TOK class and they came to maybe some visit classes and some other classes just to get a general idea of Interlake. And the... I kind of put together like, well, if there were a gifted program at Interlake, what would it be? So clearly we're an IB school, so it would be an IB program. But 
recalibrating, you know, the end of it to be in the eleventh grade seemed more logical for prism students. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like what we put together and like, what would we do senior year? Well, we'd have, you know, classes that really got into the college level as opposed to just taking a test that appears to be college level. Um, and an internship were kind of our ideas. So that's what we kind of floated out there as a proposal from the Interlink side. And, you know, there were other factors that I think the committee took into account. One of them is we had a brand new building. <laughs> so I think that was kind of an unfair advantage because, you, you know, your physical space, like, definitely makes you sort of feel differently. And even when people visit here now, comparing it to other Bellevue schools, they're like, wow, Interlake is really like open, or there's something here that's really positive. You know, and I'm like, there's lots of natural light. So they chose Interlake, okay. and then we started. And I really didn't have to, I mean, the ninth grade was fairly set, because it was really sort of a continuation um, from Odal, but the 10th and 11th were really the years that were like, oof, you know, these kids are going to start the Ivy Diploma early. One of the big things we had to have, we had two people from IBO, the international, we had to pay, or the superintendent paid for them to come out here mm -hmm. and actually like sort of give us a big green check mark. Like, yeah, you can do it early. No one else can, though. Okay. Know? So we're giving you guys special permission. We'd prefer if you kept this a little bit quiet and not, you know, you know don't send out a mass email to everyone in the world saying, we get to do IB early, because it's sort of an issue with other IB schools about when individual students get to start. Mm -hmm. But they basically said, you guys are, you really are done with high school at the 11th grade. So right. IB is the end of your high school. So it's still end of high school. We haven't changed our rules. We've just redefined who the students are. Mm -hmm. So what was that entire planning process like? Like uh, the time frame for it or the people who were communicating in it? Like what were they really focused on? What were their motives? So yeah, there were a couple of motivations. Um, one of them was that they wanted to make sure the high school program wasn't just more work. That was probably the biggest issue that committee and community, and maybe the students, but the students, you know, I don't know how well they were really represented, but their parents were well represented. Um, so we really had to think about, okay, the ninth grade, we didn't want to make just, we're just going to stack more on these students. So at the time, we kind of came up with this concept of humane rigor, we kind of all signed on to this contract of like uh, different things about the gifted program that we were going to be especially sensitive towards, like homework load and things like that. Um, another thing was that they didn't want to feel like they were graded differently than students in the same course name, but just the non-gifted sections. Mm -hmm. Like I shouldn't be penalized for how I'm doing just because I'm a gifted student, right? Um, and so that was another kind of aspect of what they were, uh, the committee was sort of looking for. And the IB part was a big part because that gave like a big stamp. Like I finished my IB diploma, I am done with high school. What's my proof? It's not the number of credits I've done in high school because I'm not done with high school based mm -hmm. on credits. I'm done with it because I've completed what the international community considers end of high school. And I owned it, right? Like I scored way higher than most other students in the world and you know, the. For the first couple of years, I was pretty nervous about that, right? Because the first set of students were really the risk takers. They weren't necessarily the best students academically right. um, in the gifted program. They were the students and families who were like, yeah, we're going to try it out. Like, we're not afraid of changing because, you know, once you know some gifted students, oh, the gifted students that all went to Newport, you know, they, they got into Stanford and la da 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 And you feel like, oh, if we don't go to Newport like the past students did, we might be you know, shutting the door of some university that I want to go to, things like that. So it really had to be the, the, the people that were really like, yeah, I think this is the right program, but I don't know because there's no data, right? Mm -hmm. It's something new. So. Okay. So that's the start of the gifted program, but how has the gifted program changed or evolved over the past seven, eight years now? Yeah, how has it changed? Mm -hmm. Maybe the kind of the backbone structure of it really hasn't changed. Um, I think with new staff, we keep having to like recalibrate their expectations um, around workload and around grading. You know, that's something that we have to keep educating them about. And that's a tough conversation because I'm not actually in charge of any teachers, you know. And um, even the people who are in charge of teachers, there's like a fine line between what you can tell a teacher to do and what you can't. 
around their job, like mm -hmm. grading, I believe, is like one of the domains. Like, I get to decide the grades. You get no input as a principal or, or district or whatever. Um, so, but the structure, the ninth grade really hasn't changed. Um, the tenth grade really hasn't changed. We have more options in the 11th grade than we did before, and that's really helped not just the gifted IB students, but also the traditional students. They have more choices, so there have been you know, subtle changes, like we have psychology this year. Um, so our course offerings have expanded. We have design technology, and that was really put in place because we realized the gifted 12s didn't have a logical science course if they had doubled up somewhere else in the 9 through 11. So, I mean, that's part of my job is to think about, well, what do these kids need? And, you know, I sort of, I share it with a couple of the teachers, like, I'm not a, you know, laurel resting kind of person, you know? Like, we should think about how to continuously improve. Yeah, like, this program looks great, and Interlake looks great, and look, it's the, we're on the fifth page of a magazine, but that doesn't mean that we're going to not continue to, like, look for ways to improve and you know, get more students involved in IB as a whole school, get more gifted students, like the kind of classes they actually want to take. So another big change was at the very beginning, um, the senior year, at the very beginning we had Bellevue College instructors and we went through a lot of different, like you guys wouldn't have known this, but we went through a lot of different ways that we worked with Bellevue College. Mm -hmm. And the positive things about Bellevue were really great. Like we got way more course choice. So, for instance, when we would sit down, like, kind of the spring before the following year, you know, I would kind of say, you know, these students have been through a fairly traditional English program. The last thing they want is another traditional English class. And the same with history, you know. So I was like, can we do public speaking, or can we do film as text, or can we do some other things? Um, but they had to make sure that they could offer those classes and find staffing and things like that. And the same thing with history, instead of doing a more traditional history class, I was like, can we do, you know, we had international relations, economics. we had economics, so anything that fit within that group. And I think economics, I knew for the gifted students was like something you absolutely wanted to do. But that relationship kind of soured. There was a couple of like big incidents. Um, and part of it soured because of you, and I don't mean specifically <laughs> you, but I mean your past cohorts. Um, the teachers, some of them you know, basically said we didn't sign on to teach at Bellevue College to teach high school kids and not gifted high school kids. And the other side of that is I'm not prepared to teach these kids because right. I'm used to kids who go to community college and it's a totally different academic <laughs> performance, clearly. So it was kind of two ways. Um, but in the end, it, basically that college said the kids, your kids will have to come to Bellevue College. So you'll just... And that, that, that might have worked, except we couldn't fit the rest of your schedule in the day. I mean, think about the transportation, think about transportation costs, if we have to pay for it, and all those kind of things. It really would make the rest of your days unmanageable if you wanted to do science and math like you should, right, um, to be prepared for college. So that got me to thinking about, okay, we've got to get a little creative. And, um, you know, just like how you might have found your internship, I just started cold calling, and one of my cold calls was to the Robinson Center, and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously they have a, they in the past had like a weak link with Interlake, because some of our students would go from the end of 10th grade, and a lot of the kids would do summer things with the Robinson Center, and they were pretty excited, and they were actually way more prepared for the meeting than I was. I was just like spitballing, kind of throwing out ideas, and they were like, well, this is the research we've done. And I was like, whoa, you guys are 100% on this already. So that's been really cool. It also fixed a lot of our other problems that we had with Bellevue. Like this professor still come here. But we have a little more input on things that may, maybe don't seem important to you, but like attendance. Mm -hmm. Like your attendance gets taken now, maybe. <laughs> um, and grades, we get your grades in a little more often where we get to see how you're performing. So kids who are kind of falling apart, we wouldn't really notice until the grades were physically transferred from Bellevue to Interlake, which was after the fact. And we're kind of concerned because, you know, you're seniors and you get so lazy you and, you know, you get caught up in other things in your lives and, you know, we just want to make sure you guys are performing or keep keeping up your performances as you did in the ninth through 11th grade. Mm -hmm. So there are positives. Obviously the negative is we have less choice. Um, but a huge positive is 
those classes are run by experts in the field of gifted education, which for us is huge. And for us to have a relationship where we as a staff have more connection to researchers in gifted education is pretty powerful. You touched on this a little bit earlier with Bellevue College teachers not being prepared to teach gifted students, um, and also with the UW teachers being specialists in that field. Mm -hmm. So in the Interlake teacher community, like how does a gifted teacher's correspond to prepare themselves for teaching gifted students or just for teaching everyone? I would, I would say in general we were not prepared at all to teach gifted students and I think some teachers feel like I still don't feel like I actually know. I remember being super anxious about my first 10th grade group because I was like how are these kids going to be different than the regular 11th graders that I've been teaching for the past several years in physics. Um, and I don't know what could, you could really do to prepare yourself because sort of experience kings all kinds of like preparation. Mm -hmm. So um, the first thing that I noticed was that the gifted kids worked together immediately, no prompting. Mm -hmm. Like I would give them a problem and normally in a physics classroom everyone would put their head down and start trying to do it and maybe you know, half of them wouldn't be able to do it. But then as a population, the gifted students would just immediately, it was kind of like, you know, like, the problem is like a carcass and the <laughs> kids are like vultures and they're just like tearing it apart, right? And they're talking to each other and they're not afraid to say, no, that's so silly. Like, that's a third law pair. Why would you include that? And, you know, that kind of stuff. Like, they felt comfortable doing that, which other students just, they feel like, ooh, I don't want to say something mean. I don't want to be attacked. I want to make myself vulnerable. And it seemed like the gifted students were just like, we are totally okay with just that kind of work, which, if you can get away with it, is pretty powerful because as a teacher, like, now I can go around and just kind of observe what they're saying and interject as opposed to prompting that behavior in the first place. Um, there's also, you know, your identity development is probably different than other middle schoolers. And what I mean by that is I know that you guys change a lot in the 10th grade, and I see the 9th graders, and I know that they came from whatever their middle school environment, and whoever kind of, you know, helps, helps you figure out who you are, right? In middle school, who you are is largely dictated by who your parents tell you you could be, right? Like... Um, you know, you got your 4.0 one semester and your parents were like on your report card, right? Like, way to go, next step, Harvard. And then your identity becomes a kid who is going to go to Harvard, right? And in that middle school atmosphere, you guys come out sort of competitive and my identity is based on making sure that other people are not doing as well as me or me proving that I'm better than someone else. And that definitely changes in the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades. But teachers have to be aware that that happens, right? And, you know, sort of those social and emotional needs are just different than other students. Um, I can't say that we've really done a, a great job on that front, but it's one of our focuses sort of this year is to try to figure out more about those kind of aspects about gifted education, not the actual mechanics of it, because we feel like, I think, Every teacher in Bellevue, and not just in like, is pretty responsive to, well, if the kids are ready to do something else, I'm going to be make sure I'm ready. Mm -hmm. So the mechanics and the content and things like that, I think, are, it's, it's easy to figure that part out with a little bit of experience. But understanding how these students might be different, and some, some teachers want to say, no, they're not different. Every kid is the same. And it's like, well, research shows that these kids have unique abilities, but also unique problems. And if those problems are unique, then we should be better at sort of confronting those or figuring them out or whatever we need to do. Do you see that the gifted, like you mentioned, the gifted students would work together to tackle a problem and that kind of atmosphere do you think is part of what the teachers are doing with the gifted program, the rigor of the IB program, or do you think that this is just a natural conversation that's developing because we're put into a smaller cohort? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, why do gifted kids work so well together? That's, that's a pretty good question. It could be that they were put under such enormous stress in their previous schooling that if they didn't work together, they would fail. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the key. I don't know. Um, I hope that it has something to do with their willingness to learn from each other, right? And just being open to 
to learning, but I really don't. I really don't know if it's sort of like the environment that they grew up in. You know, in sort of whether they went to the Bellevue kind of Odal system or they came from out of the district, um, or it has something to do with that they were always engaged. You know, in their non-school life with trying to understand things and asking questions. You know, like I imagine that. Gifted students, when they're very young, are very like inquisitive and want to know and want to understand systems, and really the you know you got to have a conversation to, to understand things. So I kind of think that it's sort of you know what whatever I don't know what giftedness does it have some genetic basis? I assume it probably does, but it's probably also like and it's fostered in some kind of environment that supports you know those kind of behaviors, and then those behaviors just kind of play out in their academics. <coughs> Um, slightly different topic. We are in a very unique situation where we have a gifted program and a traditional program learning side by side. And we've mm -hmm. clearly seen that this benefits, this seems to benefit both in terms of the courses offered. But what do you think about the communication between these cohorts, between the different teachers, and just within the school community as a whole? Do you think it's beneficial or in a way detrimental, like trickle down economics almost? Is trickle down economics detrimental? I just want to check. I don't know. But sometimes I do think about trickle down, although trickle sideways may be a better way to say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of Dr. Riley's things was try it out with the top students, and if it works through them, then use it with all students. Because with gifted students, you can kind of gamble, right? If I screw this up, they'll probably still figure it out somehow, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't do that with all students. Um, I largely see benefits. I mean, you said the teachers, but who are the gifted teachers? Like, the district will say, can you send this out to all gifted teachers at Interlake? And I'm like, well, I, do I just send it to myself? Because I think I'm the only teacher that has only gifted. I mean, every teacher here can have a gifted student. You know, rare few don't. So it, it's a, that's a little bit weird. Um, I don't think we're, you know, we're not specifically you know, trying to have, like, you have two gifted classes and three regular to make sure it balances, but it practically balances where you have gifted students and traditional students in your course load. Um, sometimes it's the same class, which actually works out really well because I can try something out with gifted students. I might be a little bit further ahead. I can try some out. If it doesn't work that well, I won't use it with my traditional students. If it works really well, I'll use the same lesson with my traditional students. Um, it also helps with that whole grade balancing. Like it's really hard to, I have to balance my grades by looking at Mr. Thompson's grades. You know, show me this kinematics test and what this kid is getting for a grade and, you know, what do you think about, you know, this test performance and, you know, that's kind of hard because I don't have the traditional kids to just like automatically match up the same exact assessments. Um, also, you know, just the benefit of having more total IB students allows us to offer more. Um, I think the traditional students really benefit from having other students who pull them up at academically, like, you know, motivate them a little bit more, help them, right? There's all kinds of um, ways that gifted students can benefit, like, the traditional students at the school. Um, you know, and I see that, I don't get to see that in my own class, but I do get to see it in, you know, mixed classes like biology, where I see mm -hmm. different students working together. And I see it all over the school where I, Sometimes I'm even surprised, like, why are you guys sitting together? You know what I mean? Oh, you know, I'm biased. I think all gifted students should be sitting together for s some weird reason, right? Because I right. see them all together in class, and that's uh -huh. just my experience. But I actually, I try to pay attention to it. Like, that's cool that you guys are working together on a CAS project, or you're doing math together, and you're, yeah, problems with integration, and so you're talking about integration. Like, that's, that's pretty cool. Plus, there are traditional students who are high academic performers, right? And so the opportunities that you guys create in, like, the classes that we can take, you know, there's a couple math kids who aren't in the gifted program, but they're pretty high up in math, mm -hmm. you know, so they get those opportunities here, whereas at, at another school, math would just end at, you know, calculus, calculus. for the year after. Right. Okay, so on to a different topic. How does the gifted program interact with the district level and maybe even the Washington State level? District level... Um, we are pretty much independent. <laughs> so they, I have a new boss downtown, um, and she's trying to kind of, you know, do a better job of kind of connecting us. But uh, the program sort of has run itself well enough at the high school le level, and where most of the changes or the need 
has been at the elementary to middle level. So the district resources have just been in the elementary to middle, and they're just like, well, Interlake, they'll figure it out. Like, they, they know what they're doing. And then it's a lot easier for us because we are a high school, right? So we have different teachers for every class, and so it's pretty easy to, like, figure out what to do with the gifted kids, whereas in an elementary school, you have one teacher, and then you've got, am I going to differentiate groups in math in one classroom, or all the kids that are great at math and maybe gifted go to another room? And, you know, so the system of early education and gifted, I think, is just more complex. Um, We go ahead on the state level because we understand that there's a highly capable bill and yep. Interlake has been shown. We found a couple of reports from Washington State regarding gifted programs, and one of the model programs was Interlake's yeah. gifted program. Yeah, they so. never asked me about it though. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Um, I mean, the people, the you know, the big wigs downtown do that kind of stuff. I don't do that stuff. Uh, I think we're a model program because I think we're the first program. I don't know if that means we should be a model program. It just means, mm -hmm. you know, we had the idea first. Uh, I mean, I think it's been somewhat successful. It's still a traditional academic program. Right. So for me, I would like to see a gifted program that is non-traditional because there are kids who are basically non-traditional. Project-based learning or... Doing something completely different, right? Mm -hmm. um, but... You know, I, I do get a lot of, like, visits from other schools and visits from kind of other kind of professionals. We just had a visit from people in Colorado who wanted to find out about our gifted program, how we ran it. Right. Um, we are so IB focused in our program that that scares off a lot of other people because they're like, ooh, well, I don't, we don't know if we can do IB, you know. Because implementing IB is not just, hey, we want to be an IB school. Like, it, that actually takes a pretty rigorous process and it's quality controlled. Whereas, you know, the competing program is AP. I could start teaching AP economics tomorrow, right? And I would be teaching AP economics. So um, there is one school that copied our program almost 100%, right? Oh, really? Ingram in Seattle. Oh, okay. So they spent a couple years thinking about it and figuring out what we do. And they came out and visited and they just basically put their program together to mirror ours doing something a little bit different. Um, Has so there I, been communication between Interlake and Ingram and after it was implemented? Yeah, I talked to their um, IB Diploma Coordinator and the Seattle Gifted kind of uh, Director of Gifted Services, whatever they call him, um, and talked to like North Seattle Community College about how do you make a class for gifted students at Ingram and things like that. So just whenever they needed my ideas or really to learn from what we did wrong and you know some of those kind of elements. So it's, the program's, I think, pretty successful and pretty close to the way that we run it. That's good. Um, another side topic. Uh, as an IB coordinator, as a gifted coordinator, sorry, what's your interaction with students and with parents? How do they communicate with you? How do they discuss issues, give feedback? Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously I interact a lot with the students. I think the students sort of don't understand what I do for a while. Um, so the 10th graders are like, oh, you're my physics teacher, and they don't understand that I was kind of their program person in the 9th mm -hmm. and the 10th grades, and at some point they figure that out. Um, so, obviously there's lots of interactions with students. Um, with parents, tons of interactions, so sometimes I'll have, you know, parents of a fourth grader that want to meet with me about gifted things. Really? You know, it's, wow. It's a little crazy, but when you think about it, like, I'm about to buy a house, and where I buy my house might impact where my daughter goes in five years. Mm -hmm. So I don't really blame them. But um, parent interactions are pretty positive overall. Um, I'm a parent, too, so it's easy for me to sort of empathize with their situations. And, you know, they've heard good things. They've heard bad things. They've heard from a couple of parents of kids who weren't that successful in our gifted program. And maybe they wouldn't be successful in lots of different academic programs. I mean, it's just like, you know, you only know what you did. Um, so I also have to work with parents who kind of get a little, like, I don't know, ornery or something like that. I don't know how to explain that. Um, a little ramped up about things where I'm like, well, that's not what the data shows. You know, like this year, 
at the beginning of this year, there was so much talk about, well, these kids aren't going to get into colleges. And I'm like, wow, this, I feel like we've had this conversation. Oh, yeah, we have the last eight years. Like, it, that happens every fall. And even the teachers get, like, a little anxious about, oh, are these kids going to get in? And, um, you know, if not enough early kids get in, what does that mean? It usually means nothing. Um, and I always look back, you know, I keep data on where everyone went to colleges. So, you know, a parent sent an email. These kids aren't, the, the kids from last year didn't get in anywhere. So then I said, well, here are the schools that the kids got into last year. Tell me which of these is not anywhere. Like, you know, tell me what the worst school on this list is. Um, and I don't know what the, I don't know how you could classify it. You know, the worst school might have been Gonzaga or Whitman. I mean, I'm just saying in this own parents, like, well, in-state would be the worst school. I don't know. In-state private, worst school, I guess. I mean, no one went to, you know, a small in-state public or, you know, but also schools are great, right? Whatever school you get into is going to work for you. Um, last year was the first year we didn't have the majority of kids go to the UW, which is kind of like telling. And our number one school was UC Berkeley, which I think is kind of funny. Like, that's, that's an odd school to have as your number one. <laughs> Especially when you, you're in Washington, right? You expect UW to be your number right. one school. So, I mean, those myths just get sent out there. And I, you know, I have meetings and I put these notes online. Like, here's a PDF of the PowerPoint that has all the data that we talked about. But still, the myths kind of persist. And those can be frustrating conversations because they're really based on one student's experience. And I've usually had that student, so I know what that student performed like academically. I'm like, yeah, I mean, we can't, we're, we don't have every student, you know, going to the Ivy Leagues. That's kind of impractical to have that expectation. Um, we had a parent, pretty cool thing he did was he took like Phillips, Exeter, Lakeside, and Interlake and like ran all of the data on admissions to each of those schools. And it was like, went to the top. First he went to the top like maybe 20 schools in the nation and showed like, look, the pattern's exactly the same for admissions from those three schools, Interlake, Lakeside, and Phillips Exeter. And then he went to like 100 schools and then UW was included. So our spike, <laughs> our, we had a huge spike at the UW, which was kind of funny. Right. It was just to show like, you know, I mean, you got to compare us to uh, another school if you want to make a claim like just these like baseless claims kind of, those can be frustrating conversations just because they're not, there's no data about that, you know, about their claims. But the other side that we don't do a good job of collecting data is the social emotional aspect. So when people say like, well, they're overworked, I'm like, yeah, they might be overworked. Or they're depressed, I'm like, yeah, they might be depressed, I don't know. Um, I think a big thing for us is we're performing really well, but are you doing too much to perform that well? Like, could you do half as much and still perform just as well? You know, that's kind of my, like, question that I've been asking myself recently. Like, how can we minimize, really, the amount of work, meaning sometimes busy work, increase, you know, your engagement, keep the rigor the same, but reduce the amount of, really, like, things you need to know? Because mm -hmm. in a way, all the stuff you learn in high school, you don't need to know any of that moving on, right? It's more like you, the process more than the actual content. Save a couple of things, but depending on what you choose to do. Right. You mentioned earlier that uh, this year the gifted program was focusing on that social and emotional aspect, like making sure that the students were satisfied in that regard. Mm -hmm. So what kind Not of the seniors, though, just to, oh, you know, starting with the ninth graders. Darn. Uh, so what kind of planning activities, what kind of communications have you been involved in in order to make that happen? Um, none, really. So our first step, and you know, school systems work really slowly. It's a bureaucratic thing. So our first step is we have a person who's an expert in the field. Like basically the high school teachers are like, we don't want other teachers to tell us how it is. Because then it just becomes stories and you know, we want an expert in social and emotional health of gifted students. And so my boss downtown said, fine, we're going to have a professional development. So we've got a guy who's uh, an expert, I hope. Um, come out over two days and his first day he's going to spend with kind of the school in general and kind of do some observations and maybe he has some metrics you know like these social sciences kind of people can have like little charts that they fill out to collect data and things like that and then he'll have a meeting with whatever high school teachers want to be a part of it because you know the gifted teacher issue like it really should be whoever wants to be a part of this school like it's a program within the school 
um, to talk about our own kind of experiences and talk about things that we can um, kind of improve or things that we can do differently or things, you know, we don't know. We're, it, we're, we are probably completely ignorant, you know. The second thing we're doing is um, the principal is going to run some kind of outside audit um, and we had one a while ago from a person who was visiting, who is, who is a huge expert in gifted education. Um, and that was really about around the time that the district shifted kind of like how they measured um, entrance tests and things like that. But um, she didn't get to spend a lot of time at Interlake because really the issue was elementary middle. Mm -hmm. um, but we'd like someone to come in and kind of like recalibrate kind of where we're at and look at really it as from it from more like an organization, not necessarily like gifted, but kind of organizational health and systems and procedures and those kind of aspects, kind of like quality control of a product. Like, because we do lose as we add staff, change staff, we kind of lose like we never proceduralize this, and so now half the people aren't doing it, half the people are still doing it, you know, mm -hmm. and those things can really affect like the efficiency of a program and consistency, and consistency of a program, yeah. Well, as a concluding question, where do you see the future of gifted education in Bellevue going towards in the next five years, ten years? Oof, I don't know. Um, there's lots of different things that I'd like to try. Yeah, um, I don't know if anyone will let me, but sometimes I just don't ask and I just do it. And then they'll find out. So, uh, I think one thing is we're going to have more gifted students at Interlake because um, mm -hmm. there's a gifted middle school program that's kind of supplanted the PRISM program and right now they're running in parallel but at one point PRISM will just go away and they'll all be in one kind of cohort but there'll be some kind of differentiation within that cohort that I don't 100% mm -hmm. understand. Um, but they'll all be, that are all planning to have them at Interlake. Um, that has some positives but also has some negatives. Um, I think overall we're kind of afraid that this will become two schools. Half the kids will be gifted and half the kids won't be and really we'll have very, very different academic performances. Um, so our own system will change quite a bit. So when I said before that the backbone hasn't changed, the backbone will have to change. And it won't change like, well, the old PRISM kids will do the old program and the new gifted kids will do something different. It'll more be like, well, there'll be more choice for every kid within how they navigate. For instance, you all did 10th and 11th English literature and you didn't, you didn't have to, that's just what we offered as an IB school. But with the 11th and 12th right now, we offer a class called language and literature. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably have a gifted section of literature and we'll have a gifted section of language and literature and students can just choose based on do I want to do something lit based for two years with lots of poetry analysis and things like that or do I want to do something that is a little more focused on communication in different genres is that what we're doing right now by the way this is yeah. true. <laughs> or uh, you know other aspects of more like more modern techniques and maybe more relevant to a student who wants to communicate in the sciences you know things like that um, we probably change, we already made some changes in the sciences to reduce the content, but keep, maybe include more engineering practices, include more projects, as you said, project-based learning. But the ninth grade science, I feel like that chemistry class is kind of like something that needs to sort of like change, and a good time to figure that out would be when we have double the number of kids, because maybe there needs to be some, what I call programmatic differentiation, like a differentiation is a big buzzword in education, it's really hard to do within the classroom, but it's kind of demanded of teachers. Um, but the easiest to me type of differentiation is programmatic, like, well, why don't you just create different classes for kids who want to do different things? You still give them the option of either one, so you're not, you know, railroading them into a certain way. But like, you know, chemistry, maybe 30 out of 120 kids really want to do AP chemistry as their first chemistry and can because they have some other experiences. Well, we shouldn't just, you know, not offer that. So with more kids, I think we could just like make that kind of a normal thing. The problem with that is those 90 kids say, uh-oh, there's 30 kids that are doing AP chemistry. If I don't do AP chemistry, I won't get into Stanford. Mm -hmm. So, or my parents tell me that. So we kind of have to like educate parents a little bit better about making good decisions for their kids or letting their kids make good decisions too. Um, like right now, I've got two, you know, last, here's another thing that really affected me as a gifted teacher. For a while, 
all the kids were pretty much prepared for physics but didn't know a lot of physics. And last year, I had a kid who was like, you already took the AP Physics B exam, you already took both of the AP Physics C exams when you were in the eighth grade, and now you're in the 10th grade. Like, what are you going to do in my class? But he's got to be part of this program, but the program is pretty set, right? You take physics in the 10th grade. So, you know, his dad and I and him kind of, you know, got together mostly via email and figured out, okay, well, I'll let you do something totally different. Like, you've got to sign up for an online class, you've got to take every test in my class, Occasionally, you've got to do a lab, and those were kind of funny because he couldn't do any of them. Um, it was really funny because we had just finished like um, uh, like the definition of work, and we did it with pulleys. I don't know if we did that together. And then we said, okay, tomorrow you've got to go in and set up a one pulley system, two pulley system, three pulley system. We couldn't set up oh, the two man, and threes. That. He was lost, but he knew. He was like, I know this is all about work. You know, like it's FD and FD is the same, but they're different forces. And I was like, yes, you know it, book. Now you have to do it for real. But differentiating that way has to happen more often because the students are different, right? And we have two chemistry students right now who are doing HL chemistry but we don't offer that class, but they're sitting outside my office every fourth period, and we just signed them up for an online product, kind of a new product from you know, someone who aligned all their stuff with IB, so it's super IB focused, and I give them exams, and you know, I see those kind of things happening where students don't need you know, 180 hours of seat time to be successful. It's completely inefficient for them to learn that way. You know, I would love to have a class of 30 kids and there's like seven different subjects being studied in that class. You know, like mm -hmm. someone's, four kids are doing economics and three kids are doing, you know, HL psychology and eight kids are doing HL chemistry and, you know, the teacher just manages sort of those online aspects. We do it for remedial kids all the time, right? Mm -hmm. If a kid needs like English retrieval, like you guys do ninth grade English retrieval and you guys do 11, but we're not willing to do it for kids who probably can learn better that way, mm -hmm. you know, like more independent, more tech-based. So I think those are the kind of things that I would like to like, it's really hard to create those opportunities inside a school system though, like, it's like, what would you call that class? And what is the certification of that teacher, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm certified in physics, so if that you're economics, you can't take my class, right? So mm -hmm. th those are problems that sort of the traditional education system doesn't have a way to, to, to to make that work, like Mr. Mel Holland, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he just got sent through the ringer. I heard that he just had to take CTE certification recently. Well, he did physics certification. Right, but now he has to do another certification. He will have to do something. We have to figure that out. Oh gosh. I mean, if we want to make it a CTE class. Uh huh. But you know, he took so much physics at university, and we want to run an engineering course, and the rest of the world is like STEM, uh -huh. and what's the E of STEM, right? Mm -hmm. Engineering, but at the Washington State level, there is no engineering endorsement. You can't have an engineer, right? You can be science endorsed and you can be math endorsed. So then it's either a science course or it's a math course. There's no engineering course. Uh -huh. So obviously our population wanted it to be a science course because it was their fourth year of science. And so we had to make it a science course. So we had to get a physics endorsement. But I mean, that his, the monetary cost wasn't so bad, but the time cost mm -hmm. was pretty rough just to get him science endorsed. Um, yeah, lots of growth, lots of revenues. Yep. Thank you for having this interview with us. No problem. <laughs> All right. Hey. It wasn't too goofy. Wait, did, does that mean Mr. Melbourne's approved to teach others?